Hey guys, welcome. Welcome back to Interstage Window, our Saturday show, which is a conversation with friends. Almost always Landon is here and Landon, of course, is here today. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. I miss you guys all so much. It's been like a month. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I need my audience. It's um, been forever, right? Because we did the community so day right before I left, and then I wasn't here, so of course we didn't stream. <laughs> yes, it's been it's been a restful and enjoyable mm -hmm. uh, hi hiatus, but I'm so glad to be back. I'm so glad for my Saturdays to start looking normal again. <laughs> yeah, that means I get to see Karen's beautiful face and Jane. My hair is blonder, isn't it amazing, Jane? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can so tell you just recently got it done. Um, it looks yes. it looks really bright on camera. It's like bling Thank bling. <laughs> no, it is. It is certainly. I'm like, oh, it's no longer the wonderful color of a mouse's fur, like it has <laughs> been for several months. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it was still blonde before. Like even like it was still blonde. It just wasn't like bright. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> but, All right. Welcome, Jane. I see you got first. Jane, I'm so happy to have you back. And um, and I know you love our Sims 2 legacy that we've been doing, so I'm glad to see you here today. Uh, and I, I hear you so much, Landon, about missing streaming. I expressed that a lot on Thursday's stream because that's how I felt too. Like, you know, I mean, I didn't miss a lot of things about being home and, um, you know, the regular hanging out kind of thing, but um, streaming I definitely missed. Uh, welcome, H. Doc. Is that how you want us to say your name? Log? H. Doc? I'm not sure. But anyways, welcome. <laughs> yeah, no, I am. Um, well, it's been weird to think about that. We have been doing ESW for over a year now. We have officially hit the year, the year mark yes. uh, of doing it consistently, basically every Saturday. Almost. It's, yeah. Almost every Saturday. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. um, so like, it's like, oh, this has become a part of my routine. And it feels weird when I don't get my claps from the audience. Um, it's true. <laughs> I'm secretly it's fine. <laughs> so you guys hear that, right? So make, giving Landon lots of attention on stream is what sustains her week to week. So you know just, what you have to do. <laughs> geez, if, I, if, if there isn't someone out there not laughing at my joke, or if I don't get someone laughing at my jokes on that Saturday, I like literally wither and die. I'm like, oh, just, just terrible. Welcome the curriculum. I love seeing all the new faces here today. This is wonderful. Happy to have it, you on the yeah. stream. Um, but uh, before we go any further, uh, and while I kind of get the game going, Landon, tell everybody <gasps> what it is we're talking about today. Oh, thank you so much for the how. Lunar is here too. Lunar, I love you. Welcome. <laughs> we're talking about one of my favorite things to talk about. And that is villains and romance. And the reason why we as a generation, as a people, as a fandom of multiple different kinds of fandoms, always seem to find ourselves shipping our protagonist and our antagonist. Oh yeah. Uh, and and why why that tends to be uh, what of our what is our history with villain romances, the pros, the cons, and the maybe societal reasons why this is happening? Mm, mm -hmm, uh, we're gonna mm -hmm. get into the all of it. So I want to hear a sound off. If there are some favorite ships uh, that you particularly love in the comments, please go ahead and say them in the chat. Go ahead and and let us know because I'd love to hear what some uh, ships that we love about villain romances are. Oh my gosh! And yeah, and we're gonna share some of ours. Um, towards the end of the stream, right? But we'd love to hear about oh, yours as well. I will, yes, fuck yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, all right. Um, oh, I'm so glad, Curriculum. This uh, this game makes me really hyped too, and we love some villain romances. Oh my God. Um, but we love to start out first before we really get into the topic, you know, Colin, while everybody's kind of coming in and um, and just hanging out, is, uh, is favorite thing. So Landon, what was your favorite thing? Gosh, for this past month, oh my God. God, it's There's been forever. Been so many things that happened. Um, I think my favorite thing is uh, my one of my dearest friends uh, got married a couple Saturdays ago, and I got to play Maid of Honor, uh, which gave me so much joy because it made me it, it involved two of my favorite things, which is telling people what to do and also getting to make a speech. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> and that it went down wonderful also true love and all of that too but that particular playing maid of honor was just it was so much fun um <laughs> Meh I on so the true love part right Meh and on the it's true okay love. <laughs> on the fact that they're going to be together forever like we all knew that this is a two-year wedding in the process no i worked damn hard and i made everybody cry that's what's really important from this week at that weekend <laughs> <laughs> Can I, can, some, can I get somebody with an exclamation Landon in the chat for that to make everybody cry? Um, uh, Jane, you know what to do. Hey, Katie, welcome. Hey! welcome. We have just started, so you haven't missed a thing. <laughs> you came in and you exclamation Landon. Oh, Katie, you're my favorite. I love that. I love that. <laughs> Jane, you too, I see you. <laughs> oh, but yes, word. what about what about you, Karen? What is your favorite thing? You've done so many adventures. Oh my God. So like, there's too many favorite things to talk about. Really. I just got back from a cruise. If you want to hear some of the fun stuff I did on that cruise, check out the VOD for my Thursday stream. It's up on my YouTube channel. Um, we played Final Fantasy X, but we're in the end game part. So it really was just kind of me talking about what's been up and mostly the cruise, right? And it was really fun. Oh my God. It was so nice to have a real vacation and not more like we've, I've taken some trips and vacations and things during the pandemic, but not really. They were all obligations. Y'all know. I mean, there was there was really no traveling during the pandemic, but I'm vaccinated. Everybody in my family's vaccinated, you know, so we took a real vacation. Oh, before I tell you my other favorite thing, we have a, a chance card for Landon. So bored of watching sea lice do nothing hour after hour, Landon decides to take a short break and play solitaire on the office computer. She looks back after finishing the game and the sea lice are gone. Where could they have gone? More importantly, what is Landon going to do? Tell Tell his boss? Hmm. <laughs> they messed up the pronoun there. Anyway, <laughs> tell his boss the truth or replace the sea lice and pretend nothing happened. What do you want to do, Landon? You want to tell Ooh, the truth or replace? Replace! Okay, replace. Landon quickly takes half the sea lice from another tank and dumps them into the original tank, hoping no one will be the wiser. Later, when her boss examines the tank, he's appalled that all the fish inside are dead. It turns <gasps> out that young sea lice and fully mature sea lice are very different. Forced to tell the truth, Landon reveals what she did. Her boss then promptly fires her! <gasps> Landon, you got fired! Oh my God, I'm so glad that your husband has a good job. <laughs> I guess you can take care of the kids. <laughs> oh my God. Yeah, oh no. Uh... <laughs> okay. Uh, well. <laughs> this, is, uh, so this was the correct choice. It just so happens that the consequences were more severe than anticipated. <laughs> Well, you know, it doesn't matter which one you choose necessarily. There's a bad option, a, a bad outcome and a good option, no matter which one you choose. So um, it's it's more for fun. Uh, you know, you, the one you chose just happened to have the really bad negative option. No, I think it's wonderful. <laughs> I loved it. Okay. All right. So anyway, what I was really going to say for my favorite thing is, um, I think I talked about this on stream before, but considering our topic today of villain romances, my for real favorite thing today is the Loki series. Okay. If y'all have not watched Good. this, it's all out. It's on Disney plus. It's wonderful. It's amazing. Um, I freaking loved it. It is a villain protagonist story right our hero is 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 the antagonist you know he's the one trying to change the status quo in the story and there is a ship in it that is amazing silky it's canon it's hot it's good the non-canon ship um lokius also super hot also super good okay we are in ot3 territory here uh super ot3 territory um, and one I'm of them is for... the same person so like oh just God. different timelines spoilers mm. <laughs> mm. okay we got some self-cessed we got some gay stuff we got some poly stuff it's wonderful this okay is... loki is wonderful <laughs> loki is uh the queer non-binary prince that we needed right and of course since he's being shipped with his alternate self his alternate self is also non-binary gender fluid person right yeah. so it, it's a, a they they romance it's wonderful we love it we love it <laughs> so yeah if y'all have not watched it. loki go stream it it's wonderful it's um one of the best mcu things that has come out ever in the past what 10 plus years that the mcu's been a thing it's great oh my god i've yeah. watched the first couple of episodes and it does it looks really good i just am not in a place to sit down and watch tv series so mm. maybe i'm going on vacation so maybe that'll have to be a thing that i do oh yeah you can watch it while you're on vacation 
Loki and Croc Loki. Yes. Big I've fan. Seen, I have seen memes of Croc Loki and I love it so much. It's he's the best. He's the best. Okay. Um we love him. We love Croc Loki. Yes, I love Croc Loki. He's awesome. Oh no, you burned your muffin, Tormund. Burned your muffin. Goddamn oh, she's sleepy. Okay. <laughs> All right. So yeah, All that's right. really that's my for real favorite thing this week. It's uh it's Loki. I I absolutely loved it. Um, I thought it was really really good. Good to know. All right. We will we will put that on the thing and maybe that'll come up in our uh in the rest of our topics. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Should we dive in? Yeah. Let's dive in. How do you want to get started? Um, I think. I think that what really needs to be discussed before we talk about romances with villains is uh, our love for villains, not our love, like shipping love, but just why we really love villains. Uh, Mm -hmm. It's been a very long time since we talked about that on the show. That was one of our, I think it was our first episode. Yeah, it was like episode, episode. I think it was like episode three, but it was the first episode where we actually did the format correctly or something like that. (laughs) Uh, So it's been a very long time since we talked about our love for villains. So Mm -hmm. let's let's fangirl on some villains for a second. Okay. All right. So I'm going to give y'all my villain loving history. Okay. So I was a young Karen, a middle school aged Karen. Just be a wee babe. (laughs) A a tiny Karen. A tinier than I am today. (laughs) Small. Um, Small Karen. (laughs) Yes. And I was I read this series around that age called Dragonlance. And for you guys that don't know, Dragonlance is a book series that's basically like a and d party going around and they save their fantasy world of Corinne, right? And um, one, of the, one of the characters in Dragonlance is named Raceland Madre, right? And he's not really like the villain or anything. He is an evil aligned wizard, but he's part of the, the group, the protagonist of, the, of the, the story. He's in the main D&D group, right? He's not, he's not really a villain. Later on, he has some villain parts. This is a huge series, okay? There's like a gajillion books. But at the beginning, he's not really, right? So um, what was really cool about this series that I thought was that it was like, okay, so somebody that's not necessarily always aligned with the with what the main party is doing like morally or things like that but he goes along with them for other reasons he has a twin brother that's a that's a goody two shoes right so he has other reasons to go along with them but um but morally he's not the greatest guy you know he's kind of just out for himself that's that's how that's how he is and it was the first thing that i had ever read where you really got a glimpse at why a character might do certain villainous things right because i was still very young right i was still very young so i just hadn't read a lot of stuff where that happened and he's a fan favorite if you've read these books then he's probably your favorite too but he is absolutely amazing i don't want to spoil too much um, because they're really good books and they're really character driven and i think you all should read them (laughs) but um but basically he is the epitome of like a um, anti-hero type of character Ooh. he's he's not a good guy but he does help end up saving the world right so i just absolutely fell in love with this character i thought he was amazing by the way he never really gets a real canon ship but the main fandom ship for him is with his twin brother so you know that's how that all started as well <laughs> Um, so I was really fascinated with this character and all my friends are reading Dragonlance too. And they were of course very fascinated with this character because that's, that's what's up. And, um, so that was kind of the first, the first one. After that, you, I kind of kept going. I was also reading Harry Potter. I had started Harry Potter much earlier, but you know, in the first couple of books, you really don't get to know much about the villains except for Draco. Draco is really the only one that you know in the first couple of books. And I was kind of, he, I wasn't really super taken with Draco. Draco's, Draco's my Landon's type, right? <laughs> <laughs> I was about to be like, ah, oh, that only makes one of us. <laughs> yeah, um, but as you get into the later books and you start learning about like how the Death Eaters work, and um and bella um bellatrix in particular and everything that happens with the black sisters i became absolutely enamored with the the blacks right um with bella and especially with andromeda and what she goes through and how she is somehow raised in that environment 
and um, and it's implied that she's in Slytherin house and everything, and then she still ends up being able to work against that. I thought that was amazing, and like what it means for um, for uh, for Narcissus and um, with Sissy, and how she is you know allied with the Death Eaters and with that awful side, but she still doesn't want her son to go down that path, right? And various other things around that. Like I think Sirius is a fascinating character, etc., etc., etc. Right? Y'all get the idea. So, when it comes to Harry Potter, that was like something that I was super taken with was um, was the Death Eaters and the concept of the Death Eaters and uh, and and what it meant to dig into some of those characters. Now, Harry Potter is of course way more black and white than Dragonlance is, so I had to get a lot of this fuel from. Uh, the fandom, but luckily the Harry Potter fandom is massive, and you can find whatever you want. Yes, you can find whatever you want about whoever you want. So, um, and one of my favorite things in Harry Potter, as as you guys know, and we'll talk about a little bit later, is um, Harry Potter has a lot of characters that all you ever get is their names and maybe one or two facts about them, and nothing else. And one of my favorites is to take those characters and expand on them right in the fandom sense and there is a plethora of death eater characters that you can do that with because jk rowling don't explain her villains they're just evil so <laughs> i feel like i feel like you have personal experience with this karen i mean maybe we'll talk about that in a second <laughs> <laughs> and of course um also in addition to in addition to death eaters i was always super taken with the villains in disney movies um, you know, I, I was all here for uh, Gaston and Beauty and the Beast. I think he's an excellent character. I mean, that doesn't mean he's a good guy. I just think he's an excellent character, right? I love Ursula and the Little Mermaid. I love Scar and the Lion King. You know, all those, all those Disney Renaissance villains. Uh, they were always, like, my favorites, and I was super taken with them. Like, that was, that was me. Like, I was the kid that's like, oh, do you like Simba or Nala? And I'm like, I like Scar. <laughs> 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 yeah um jafar yes exactly i'm wearing my jafar shirt today this is um an artist that has a disney villain um breakfast cereal series of, of oh, art. That's so is, cool. yeah and this is uh a, the jafar one jafar. uh gaston's an absolute himbo agree hard agree <laughs> i um, slight disagree because he doesn't treat women well enough to be a himbo you know However, what he paved the way for characters like Kronk, who is technically a Disney villain. Mm -hmm. uh, he is an absolute himbo. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Gaston walked so Kronk could run. Yes. No, honestly, that's how it worked. They were like, oh, yes. people really like this character, even though we wrote him to be an asshole. Maybe we should write one that talks to squirrels. <laughs> and everybody loves Kronk. He's wonderful. The best. <laughs> so, that's, so that's my story of like, the villain characters that uh, that I grew up with, that I loved, um, and it all started around middle school age and just kind of grew for there, from there, and it has never stopped. I still am very interested in most things that I read or watch in, um, especially if I'm stepping into the fandom of something, of like, what's the fandom around the villain character, right? Like, that captivates me in a way that uh, the protagonists often don't. <laughs> Or the hero characters often don't. They do. So, so that's my story. Um, Landon, what what about you? What's what's your uh, villain character loving story? Very similar. Um, I think that I think that the small difference is that I, um, especially in middle school, when I became an avid Harry Potter fan, I'm a Slytherin. And the recognition of Slytherin characters that we get, as we've talked about on stream before, is that they are evil children. <laughs> they are they are children who are going to become evil and terrible human beings and everyone who is evil is Slytherin. And so someone who identifies as a Slytherin, I then of course was like, well, if I'm a Slytherin, I must be evil. So let me just obsess with, about all the evil characters. <laughs> Uh, and, and there was a certain, like, being like, especially with Draco Malfoy, but also, you know, Theodore Knott and Blaise Zabini and, and the ones in school, Pansy Parkinson, the ones in school with Harry, I really found like an interesting connection to, because again, we don't get much information, but the, the fandom they, then makes them alive mm -hmm. and being able to enjoy like the fandom interpretations of these people that are supposed to be evil that I aligned myself with 
because I was similar to what I viewed these characters would be was really, really cool. And I think that that gave me a different perspective on villains when, uh, when, when looking at media in general. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. So that really set me up for success as far as being like, go team villain. Um. <laughs> yeah, Slytherin's the bad boy house. Curriculum, if you're interested, we have a whole episode. It's on my YouTube channel um, where we broke down some of the um, the issues and uh, interesting things in regards to the Harry Potter houses. And we talked mostly about Slytherin because that's really that's really where the meat is in that discussion. <laughs> uh, but absolutely, it was like, oh, I'm a bad bad boy. Woohoo! <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly who I am as I'm smiley and bubbly and I was a little goth it's fine um <laughs> and then also at the same time with Disney I love the Disney villains Jafar I think is still one of the most fascinating and, and amazing Disney characters Scar as well they're basically the same character but love them both um and I think what I discovered is that the Disney how the Disney uh, algorithm works is that Disney is teaching kids that people are inherently good, which is a great lesson to learn. Um, but because of that, there doesn't need to be much backstory when it comes to its protagonist and its good side characters. Mm -hmm. uh, they just kind of exist and they're funny and they're good and they're on the good side. The villains need reasoning to be bad. Mm -hmm. Uh and, and that has developed more and more as Disney has aged, when we get like Frozen, where we get a whole backstory with Hans um, and, and uh, a bunch of other like antagonists get backstories. You know, Scar is jealous, Jafar is jealous. And because of that, I always felt that those characters were better explained and defined. And because of the attention of being like, okay, I have to actively think, why is this character evil? When you never put in that, that work as for why is this character good that translated as better developed and i enjoy incredibly developed characters mm -hmm. so that drew me into the villains uh and then i discovered and discovered and, and learned about mm -hmm. dc comic villains and how incredibly like they take dc takes that step further mm -hmm. where they they do like develop the protagonists but particularly batman but all of his villains are also like stand for something um and and none of them are evil for the sake of being evil mm -hmm. and that depth into that character and mindset and trying to understand i just think is fascinating uh so that made me fall in love with villains even more yeah and batman has the greatest rogues gallery does oh. it not Fucking yes. Uh, and, you have, and it's a variety. Like that, that was one of the reasons I hated, I, I don't particularly like Superman uh, because Superman is pretty standard. Whereas like good is good, bad is bad. And there's no reasoning for these things other than good is good and bad is bad. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but as Batman has developed and their villains have developed, there is reasoning behind everything. And mm -hmm. all of them are incredibly unique. It isn't formula. It's just like, hey, there is something that made me this way. Yeah. Uh, which I think is as close to real life as as you can get as far as like people aren't inherently bad. They make choices that are for the best of them. And just because you're on the opposite side of that, like it just, it makes it seem real. And I love that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. <clears throat> Um, Ty, oh, Ty, I do love this line. Uh, Ty has a good comment about Guardians of the Galaxy. I think the best, most unique motivation for doing something good comes from Guardians of the Galaxy, where the motivation for wanting to save the galaxy is because I'm one of the idiots who lives in it. I did love that line because I feel like in a lot of stuff, um, that is very much implied but never stated. And so you just feel like, like, why? You know, because um, we all would love if given the opportunity to be able to help out the world, but a lot of us aren't given that opportunity. Right. And I do think most people would react as like, well, let me try to do the right thing because I have the opportunity to do the right thing. Um, but in a lot of fiction, it's not really it's not really explained or, or stated. You know, it's just assumed that this is the natural state. Well, and, and also those those protagonists within fiction are also going above and beyond what mm -hmm. I think the normal human would do. Yeah, uh, because I think that, yes, when given the chance of save the world, not save the world. I think it also, we have to take in the concept of how much sacrifice that requires. And most protagonists within, within fiction are willing to sacrifice everything. Mm -hmm. 
everything. Yeah, most people aren't. <laughs> Which again is something that we will bring up later as far as villains and like why why people love them so much too. Uh, is because villains a lot of the time with romances villains are willing to risk everything except for what they believe is right and oftentimes a person <laughs> like <laughs> you're willing to like burn down the world for burn down the whole world to save one person and, and fuck morals and fuck society going to do that thing so that's that's another part of it too is that that's the difference anyway that mm -hmm. was tangent. <laughs> um but yeah i mean that's what made me really fall in love with with villains i love that uh and then i came across rp and uh i even though i had been writing villainess characters in my own writing i finally had the opportunity to write a villain mm -hmm. uh, and it's which, different when you're writing solo stuff right the villain oh, is yeah. just one of many characters when you're role playing and you role play a villain it's like that's what you're really focused on and it changed my life uh for multiple reasons but one because you and i got so close because we started doing ravi yes okay so um we have talked about this before on stream but just because it's super relevant here uh, i'd like to take a moment to explain kind of a little bit more about how landon and i met so we met actually in a um you know, once upon a time role play, right? And we were friends there, but it wasn't like, it, we weren't like super, super close, right? We, we were kind of close, but not super close. Uh, your sim wants to get a job again. That's good. Oh, no, that's good. <laughs> she took time off, and then she's like, these kids are fucking driving me crazy. <laughs> After only one night, she can't handle it. <laughs> she's a single um, mom is hard, y'all. And she thought he, I meant stay-at-home mom. I said single mom because I want someone to kill Malcolm. Um, <laughs> but being a, being a stay-at-home mom is hard, y'all. It's a real job. <laughs> yes. All right. So, so we met in that Once Upon a Time role play, but... Pretty soon after that, a friend of ours opened up a Harry Potter role play. And this is where we really got close because we started shipping together. Because Lan decided that she wanted to play Rebastian Lestrange, which is one of the kind of name only Death Eater characters that uh, that you have in Harry Potter, right? One of the Death Eater characters, he's not super developed, he gets like a line or two, that's that's it. That's that's all you get. Um, he's Rodolphus's brother. That's the whole story. <laughs> and so Landon was like, I want that. That and, one. Uh, that one. Yes. Yeah. So good enough. <laughs> <laughs> so then um, we, she had picked out face claims for them, which were basically the um, Clara line. So if you have watched, uh, if you have watched Vampire Diaries, then you know Clara line as the ship with Klaus and Caroline. She's like, I need somebody to play the Caroline face claim. And I said, hi. I will see this. this I, great. Yeah, I do remember I was like, have you ever have you ever watched Vampire Diaries? Do you know what Claroline is? No, you should, because here's a perfect face. Please ship with me. <laughs> and I said, sure, of course. Like Landon explained to me the dynamic and I was like, Yep, that's actually what got me to watch Vampire Diaries, by the way. Um <laughs> I think it was in season it, the the show was in season three at that point, and I had only ever seen like I'd seen most of season one, but then I hadn't really kept up with it. So that's what really got me to watch it and get invested. Right. Um, Katie, I so see that you did the kill a sim. Don't I'm... worry then, we will try to kill Malcolm this stream. So then Landon <laughs> will be a single mom and I'm so <sighs> glad she wants to get a job again. Um, Cause that would really suck if we killed, uh, if we killed Malcolm off and, uh, and nobody was there to take care of the kids. It'd be pretty short legacy, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have been saying to Karen, I'm like, we, I hope whoever, I hope we kill off the husband. <laughs> okay, so here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna, Anyway. We're going to kill him off in a, a little bit of a brutal way, but also in a kind of simple way. Um, because I just I just don't want things to be too complicated for this. No, I don't need a foundation. I just need walls. I just need walls. Put him in a box. Yes, we're going to put him in a box and starve him. Oh no, insufficient funds. <laughs> the trust fund ran out so quickly that we couldn't even afford to... <laughs> yeah, we don't have a lot of money. Um, we don't have enough for a door. Okay, well we'll have to wait till we get some more money because we need a door on our box, and then we'll then we'll, we'll put him in the box and we'll kill him. Murder, <laughs> murder on a budget. That's right. 
um, but yeah, we we went in with the intention of writing a villainous ship mm-hmm. uh, with with truly two fucked up, very fucked up individuals, mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and wanted to write a happy ish story involving them. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, happy for them. Well, yeah, no, it, and <laughs> happy in general. I mean, they found each other and fell in love, and just because he, you know, she was the object of his serial killer tendencies, didn't have to get in the way of that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um. Basically, the the plot was here. We're gonna we're gonna use his aspiration points to get us some money. Basically, um <laughs> the the plot <laughs> the plot was essentially like um, Rebastian was like a really bad guy already. Um, Abby had bad guy tendencies, and Rebastian was going to, um, encourage such tendencies. <laughs> he was gonna... alive long enough for that. Yeah, she was like, I, she was like, I've decided, I do want to be a Death Eater, I, I, I care about this cause. And Rebastian said, that's wonderful, would you like help, in, you know, with, on that path? <laughs> and that was the whole ship. <laughs> No, it was wonderful. Uh, and sorry, the chat is being funny. Um, yeah, no. no, y'all are being hilarious today. Thank you so much. <laughs> uh, that was the moment that I was like, oh, I will forever write villains and I will forever ship with them because mm-hmm. it's fantastic. It's fun. It's dynamic. And I think because, and and I think that that's a good transition to talk about like, why it's so fun why is it so different to ship with a villain versus doing a different kind of ship mm-hmm. no matter what that villain ship is no matter if it's a redemption arc no matter if it's a making one of the characters worse or or more villainous such as like our ship was um even if it's like a neutral where no one really changes why is it that shipping with a villainous character is so different than just a regular traditional ship. Yeah, um, and it's kind of like, you know, we we love villains so much and they're always having so much fun. So another way to ask the question I think is like, why are villains always the ones having so much fun? And I see you, Cookie, thank you so much for the lurk and the host, I really appreciate you. Um, yeah, so why are villains so much fun? Well, this is what I think, right? This is why I think villains are so much fun. And it goes back to the Hayes Code. So I'm going to give a little introduction on the Hayes Code here. I, most of y'all have probably heard of it before, but I just want to make sure that everybody's on the same page. So what is the Hayes Code? And so the dropping a link. Yes, thank you. Um, so if y'all want to read more than what I say today, here's the Wikipedia page. You can go read more about it. So what the Hayes Code was, was at this time that the Hayes Code started, there was a bunch of states that were introducing legislation to censor movies, right? Politicians had decided that movies were the reason for all of our debauchery, right? They were the reason that everybody was, you know, into sex, drugs, and rock and roll. It's these goddamn movies. And um, so they were, in- they were introducing legislation. It's like 20-something states, like a lot, like not, not nothing, right? So Hollywood didn't necessarily want this. This wasn't like something that they just decided on their own. But it was something that they were responding to, like they were responding to this pressure and they had decided that um, that due to this pressure, they needed to take it into their own hands. Like they decided, okay, they're going to legislate us into censorship. We need to take control and do the censorship ourselves, because if we let them legislate it, it's going to be 10 times worse. Right. So they hired this consultant, which is why it's called the Hayes Code. Right. That was his name. So why are you sneaking in there when they're about to do the dew torment? Get out. Go eat your cereal. Anyways. You know, you know who the villainous kid is. <laughs> so um, they hired this guy, Hayes, right? That was going to help them um, be not so debaucherous. <laughs> and, and Hayes helped Hollywood develop this code. There was a whole bunch of stuff that they were going to self-censor on 
to avoid being legislated into censorship, right? So there's like 11 things that you can't have in movies and then a whole bunch of things that you can only have if um, you portray it as like a bad thing. Torment, stop going in there. My freaking God. Oh, he oh. is. <laughs> <Hero Yeah. killer. laughs> They're just trying to have some adult time. <laughs> Tormund, God. <laughs> but mommy, entertain me. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, um, so basically, that's what the Hayes Code is. So the thing that I want everybody to understand is that Hollywood wasn't like, oh my gosh, sex is bad, let's put in the Hayes Code, right? It was direct pressure from politicians to do this. They didn't just come up with this on their own, okay? So I think that's something that people miss a lot of times when talking about the Hayes Code. So that being said, because this list is freaking wild, Landon, I would love if you could read those 11 things to us that per the Hayes Code are not allowed in movies. Now, by the way, the Hayes Code doesn't exist today, but this is what it was during that time. Let me let me put on my operator voice. Hold on. Okay. <laughs> Pointed profanity by either title or lip. This includes words such as God, Lord, Jesus, Christ, unless they are to be used relevantly in connection to the proper proper religious ceremonies. Hell, son of a bitch, damn, and God, or any other. Pro profane and vulgar expressions however it may spelled let it be known that that second god was spelled g-a-w-d you can't that's say the god. first one <laughs> <laughs> any uh, any suggestion or actual nudity in fact or in silhouette and any litigious, wow, litigious, litigious notice, thank you. Oh, no, lysacious, notice, probably. It's probably lysacious. lysacious. Thank you. Any lysacious notice, therefore, of the characters in the picture. Bodies are bad. You should be shamed. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the illegal, not, that last part, it doesn't say that, but that's what it implies. <laughs> the illegal traffic in drugs. I have no comment to that one. Mm. <laughs> any difference of sexual pervasion, <laughs> which means anything but mission mission <laughs> missionary. I am trying to make jokes and my, my words aren't coming out. The most important, <laughs> the most important, white slavery. Other forms okay, of can slavery. We pause here. <laughs> can we pause here? This <laughs> is like wild to me. So basically what they're saying is like, you can depict slavery that's cool so long as the victims aren't white if the victims are white you cannot depict this what like what why this makes no this is so stupid this is so st anyways hollywood's racist this is what this reveals <laughs> anyway go on <laughs> uh it's the sixth one is miss san Jernation, which is the mar yes which is the marriage of people who are of different races so white people and black people cannot touch or marry on TV because then it would be very bad. <laughs> Seven, sex hygiene and venereal diseases because let's not talk about the things that actually happen to our bodies so that people feel shame about their bodies. Pointing back to number one. Uh, eight, scenes of actual childbirth in fact or in silhouette. Nine, children's sex organs, 10, ridicule of the clergy, and 11, willfully offense to any nation, race, or creed. And those are just the ones that are sh straight up not allowed. There are 25 other things that should not be talked about. And we can, we can mention the highlights of those if we would like. Yeah, yeah, just pick out a couple. We don't need to read all 25. Y'all will get the idea after hearing a few of them. Uh, any use of firearms, theft, robbery, safe cracking, or dynamite of trains, mines, buildings, etc. Uh, <laughs> sympathy for criminals. Attitude towards public characters and institutions. First night scenes. Men and women in bed together. Deliberate seduction of girls which is so strange to say seduction of girls instead of women but that's fine the institution of marriage uh and titles and scenes having to do with law enforcement or anything enforcing laws 
excessive or lustful kissing, particularly when one character or the other one is heavy. Heavy means criminal. But I needed to do that quote. So those were the <laughs> those were the highlights. Yeah, so you can kind of get the idea, right? What this what uh, the effect this ends up having is that any character that's allowed to do anything fun is going to be a villain because the only way you're allowed to do any sex, drugs, or rock and roll is if you're a bad guy because all of these things, like, they're allowed, but only if it's clear in the movie that these are, like, bad things that you're not supposed to do, right? So that's that's the effect. The effect ends up being that only villains get to do anything fun. Yeah. That, um, and that if you behave in any of these particular ways, then you are a bad person and again let the villains get to do the the fun things so even though that this no longer exists within our society the ramifications and the echoes of it do Mm -hmm. um because things like hitting on you know women deliberate seduction of girls um there's there are different ways that this is portrayed as villainous versus good right um, but like it is, it is painted in that light mm-hmm. um, that, Hey, uh, that nice guy who's walking you home that doesn't seem outwardly hitting on you is the good guy. But the guy calling from across the bar is the bad guy. When mm-hmm. both of these characters might not have like good intentions. One is a nice guy. The other isn't. Mm-hmm. And it's that one that's calling out from across the bar. That's the evil guy right from the movie code right that doesn't that doesn't plant pan out that way in real life a lot of times but in the movies that's how it is um by the way they had education track available for landon and that's her lifetime want so um so we're gonna we're in the education track now for landon's career you know what it actually turns out that replacing and lying about those fish were the best thing to ever happen (laughs) pursue exactly what he wants to do Exactly. So it was good. It was a good thing. <laughs> um, oh, but yeah, no childbirth, uh, anything like that. It's it's really fascinating to see what yeah. was considered uh, non no go. So so really, a, a lot of um, women's experiences are basically not allowed to be portrayed or not allowed to be portrayed in certain ways, um, and this kind of bleeds over, right? Like it doesn't. It doesn't say it in the Hayes Code. Like, it doesn't say no gay stuff. However, (laughs) um, everything that it does say, the result ends up being that nothing, nothing important for the girls, the gays, or the theys, right? Like, it makes everything much more in line with patriarchal values when you start censoring the types of things that the Hayes Code censors. And we still see so much of that today. We still see so much of that today. Like just now in the past, um, I don't know, half a decade or so, that um, that there's a lot more media that depicts things that are important or, um, or part of life for the queer community. And um, there's a reason why for the longest time, there was no depictions of that. It's not because queer people weren't making movies. <laughs> It's because there was pressure to only include those experiences for villain characters. And so you end up with all of these like queer coded villains because that's the only chance that a lot of creatives got to put queer people into their movies. And for better or for worse, Hollywood movies are our main source of entertainment in this country. They are. But then that inherently also proves a bad point like absolutely you want representation and so the opportunity to do it especially if you're a queer person the opportunity to do it is better than no opportunity at all but Mm -hmm. then if every single person or every single villain is queer coded society wise that tells us that being queer is then inherently villainous or evil Mm -hmm. which then plays into that whole thing as well and then it's like okay all the representation we ever have is uh villains and that means that you're bad for being queer yeah and it's awful it's like that's an awful message to send right but that's what ends up happening absolutely Um, 
And yeah. so basically we can blame a lot of the stuff that we still suffer with in regards to uh, Hollywood media and things of that nature. Uh, we can blame it on conservative politicians, you know, just like most of the ills of the modern world. Because <laughs> that's what it traces back to. <clears throat> oh... <laughs> so i think i think at this point probably um let's let's talk about a little bit about that um what is what is queer what is queer coding like from your perspective landon what does that mean okay so queer coding is basically things and stereotypes that have to do with being queer so being flamboyant uh for men being flamboyant or and feminine, probably. And feminine um, or wearing, you know, or emotional in general. So not just flamboyancy, but also heavy in emotion. Mm -hmm. um, wearing certain outfits, having certain dramatic flair. I'm thinking particularly of Hades from Hercules right now. Uh, oh, but you yeah. can also do Jafar from, from Aladdin. There's so much queer coding in all of this. Yeah, I mean, um, he's the gayest straight man, like, that I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Hades is straight up gay in Hercules. No one can can bother me with that. Oh, um, yeah, for real. There is no, like, there is no hetero going on there. The fact that, like, and this is a separate thing, but I just need to make this point, um, that the fact that Ursula, which is one of the few female villains we have in the Disney, in Disney, at least mm -hmm. in the Renaissance age, yeah. uh, is based off of a drag performer mm -hmm. who is a gay man. So the woman character is based off of a gay man dressing as a woman, mm -hmm. um, but is the villain within the story. Is There's just so many layers there. So it, queer coding <laughs> is basically, basically being like, oh, here are all these things that are stereotypically within queer context or gay or anything like that. And we are going to present it as not coming out as as gay. Like we are mm -hmm. presenting it as straight. We are presenting it as uh, normal, but it is there enough for people to make connections to and understand what is happening. Yep. So basically what it <laughs> what it is, is that like, if you are part of the LGBT community, then you know, oh, that person's probably a little L G B or T, right? Yeah. And if you're not, then you probably don't notice, right? That's what queer coding is. And it's deliberate, right? So when we say something is coded, what we're saying is that the author made this deliberate choice. Like you can't accidentally code something. So I wanna make that clear because I feel like the internet misuses a lot of these terms and they'll be like, oh, this character's queer code. And it's like, but if the author did not intend that, then no they're not <laughs> so that's what queer coding is and there's so many disney villains that are definitely queer coded like um ty mentioned scar yes 100 yeah, percent, absolutely um scar, absolutely queer coded scar hades and jafar are typically and ursula i would say are mm -hmm. the the most disney queer coded that there are but so is the joker from batman mm -hmm. um and yeah, so so is the Joker. I'm trying to think of others. There, there's just so many. Mm -hmm. <laughs> also, if if a man has an obsession with another man, there's a little bit of queer coding going on there. <laughs> um, <laughs> sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. The author's putting in a little bit of that. All right. So Malcolm is in his box. Um, so we'll we'll see what happens. <laughs> um, Ty asks, does this happen? This character shows X trait, which is associated with Y stereotype. Therefore, people who are Y are bad. So in isolation, no. So you can't take one character in isolation and be like, oh, they do this and this character's effect on society is X, Y, Z. Okay, Th these things that we're talking about are in mass. Like we can give you examples, right, of queer coding in, in, Dis in, in Disney villains, but that doesn't mean that the people that are working for Disney caused this problem or like or individually did this or that these individual characters did it right it's a trend throughout um throughout lots of pieces of media that says something about how we as a society feel okay so we're not so when we when we talk about this stuff we're not saying oh the media caused this we're saying the media reflects this feeling that society already has and contributes to it 
and progresses it by repeating these tropes over and over and over and over and over. Does that make sense? I hope that makes sense. Yeah. And at several different levels, like we are talking about children, childhood levels, like with Disney, but these expand beyond that too. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I'm just like, even Thor Ragnarok, um, or Ragnarok, sorry, uh, the game master who is not the main protagonist or the main antagonist, but is certainly one that is holding Thor captive played by Jeff Goldblum uh, isn't queer within canon within the movie, but he has all of the mannerisms and all of the thoughts of that. Like, so that's like even a step up from, it's not just Disney movies. It's not just things that it is every single movie, not every single, but several movies throughout society. Villains are portrayed as eccentric and, you know, just very queer coded. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the point of bringing this up is because, well, why do you think women love the villains and they love villain romances? It's because whenever we are watching something and we can really identify with what the character is going through, like you can a lot of times with villains, right? You end up with this situation where that's that's who you're identifying with. That's who you want to see the romances with. So that really applies to like when Landon was sharing her story and the villains were often more um, developed characters. So that's what she was interested in, right? Like um, for those of you guys that don't know, we have an inner stage window episode on this where I talk about some struggles that I've had with my gender, right? So of course I look at other characters that are struggling with their gender. I identify with that. Right. Um, for those of y'all that, that don't know that are new to the show, Landon, not straight. <laughs> so, you know, she sees the gay I characters believe... and she identifies with that. Right. I believe I was like, I described this to someone that I was like, my sexuality slash gender identity is that equivalent to a human shrug. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the more time goes on, the more it kind of feels like that, doesn't it? Um, Tier, I want to answer a question that you asked a little while ago. Are you queer studies scholars? No, I. we are both actually educators, different kinds of educators, but that's our job. Uh, Landon was an English major, though, and so she does actually have some training on this. I don't. Yeah. I'm just a loser that thinks way too hard about the stuff that I read, and I've spent my entire life in fandom. So um, I, I am, I guess you could say... Um, uh, what's what's the what's like the hedge witch what's like saying a, a like you say a hedge witch uh but for a scholar for a queer study scholar i don't know i'm that Feminine. whatever that is no Feminine. no one's ever taught me how to do this i just watch a lot of and read a lot of stuff <laughs> uh and yeah to to clarify that too i was an english major with my minor was in uh if i had a traditional minor would have been in gender and uh queer studies mm-hmm. as far as mm-hmm. literature goes so i i yeah, do so- have quite a bit of experience about this kind of stuff so Landon, it actually kind of is. I'm I'm just a hedge witch. I'm just I'm just, You're just a, a hedge here. witch just, of feminism. <laughs> I'm here. I'm just here to look pretty. <laughs> I'm really an educator. I don't know anything. I just know how to take information other people are telling me and uh, regurgitate it back to you guys. <laughs> All right. So, hi. That is a great question. Do people genuinely have thought process of Ryan from High School Musical, Scar and Jafar, are camp, and because of that, they are bad guys. Therefore, anyone who is camp or infeminate are bad guys. That is not the conscious uh, thought process at all. But like most things in society, uh, we learn from like uh, subconscious things. We learn from um, things that we see in media and the way that people are treated and all of these things. And we don't know that we're taking in these thoughts uh, until we are challenged with them. Mm -hmm. so when you so no one's sitting there and being like oh my gosh Jafar wears a funny hat and has an obsession with a man uh (laughs) and Mm -hmm. is and is eccentric and all of these things and and all these things that are like queer coded uh therefore he must be bad it's more like I see enough of these types of characters to know that hey I meet someone who is Jafar like I then dislike that and then I discover that the people that I'm meeting are the Jar- Jar- Jafar like might be within the LGBTQ community. Yeah, like and it's, it's even it's even more insidious than that. Like a lot of times absolutely. it starts it starts like from what you learn from your parents and your your peers growing up. So like maybe your your dad makes a lot of anti-gay jokes. He thinks that's really funny, right? And and that's where it really starts. And the then it, 
looking at Jafar and Aladdin, that just, you know, encourages those same thoughts. Like, watching Jafar and Aladdin doesn't put those thoughts there for people in vast majority of situations. It's they have already learned these things and then they see it reinforced in the, you know, TV show or movie or book or whatever that they're consuming. Yeah, and to make it not as big systemically, we can also apply this to things like video gamers. Video mm -hmm. gamers are, a, are portrayed one way within media, therefore there is an assumption that that is what, what video gaming looks like is someone who never sees the light, who's always eating junk food, who never sleeps, who has unhealthy habits, who does all these things, when we all like to play video games once in a while and don't have that stereotype around us. Yeah. Like that's also like um, that's also a way that it that this it, it works the same way. Mm -hmm. But like you're more likely to believe that oh all video gamers are like that if you happen to know one video gamer like that growing up, and then you go see that in media, and then it's really easy for your brain to say like oh well they're all like that because the one example I have definitely is like that, and this movie portrays it like that too. Let me put that all together, right? But like it doesn't start with the movie. Like that's the point. Like it 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 do it doesn't start with the piece of media where where you found it even if you think you learned it from there you didn't right it's just it just doesn't work that way yeah exactly um so there is there is a huge yeah it's a it's a it's a system i mean it's just part of the the systems that we have created racism exists the very a very similar way too mm -hmm. within mm -hmm. our our society so yep um which is also like villains there are several villains that are also race coded yeah. Um, and and that have uh, like a lot of the biggest example that I that I found in the research that I that I saw was um, like the from the Jungle Book uh, that there is like this idea that there's that there is a song within the Jungle Book where the main protagonist is an ape who wants to copy Mowgli, who is a human uh, so that he can then take over the humans and there are a bunch of stereotypes, not only how this villain is drawn, but also how the villain acts that was portrayed very similarly to how it was assumed in stereotypes that black people act wanting mm -hmm. to be white. Um, and like this happens quite a bit with villains as well. Uh, Scar yeah. is, is coded, Jafar as well, uh, follows a lot of Arab stereotypes. Uh, whereas not a lot of other characters in the Aladdin movie does. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a lot. <laughs> uh, so that's also <laughs> another thing to put on this too, is it's it is there's also racism tied to our villains, uh, even if the villains are portrayed as white. Yep. So when we talked about queer coding, it's kind of like, well, so the villains are there for the girls, the gays, and the days. Guess what? The villains are there for the POC too, right? Because that is a huge part of, of the villains as well. And and again, the Hayes Code never says, you know, uh, racism's good, y'all, let's do that. But it says things like, white slavery is not allowed to be portrayed, but black slavery is. Yeah. Huh, strange, right? <laughs> so you end up with the situation, you end up with the situation where anybody that is not part of the status quo or doesn't see themselves as part of the status quo, in the world is likely to identify with the villain characters more than they are likely to identify with the hero characters. So mm -hmm. I know that's how it happened for me. I'm sure for Landon, that's how it happened too, based on no. what we had said for our interests. You know, you can kind of see like, you can kind of see like how this would happen, right? And how this ends up happening to a lot of people. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so Ty, that's what I meant, orangutan, um, and he is, he, the character is race-coded to be Black. Like, there is a yeah. lot of similarities between um, how he is drawn and portrayed, and how back in the, I want to say that was in the 70s, 60s? Mm, that was long, um, yeah, a long time ago. It was a long time ago, uh, were portrayed as well. So the, mm -hmm. there are similarities there, and it's just another example of how villains can be coded. Yeah, and it's subtle, like, it's subtle, right? Yeah. And you can say, what does that have to do with race? Well, that's what they want you to say, right? The people that are that are that put this coding in, they know that there's plausible deniability there, right? And so, oh. Oh. sorry, 
<laughs> oh no, you're good. And so, and so a lot for a lot of these, you know, it's easy to say like, oh no, they're not supposed to be, you know, this race or that race, or they're not necessarily supposed to be gay or whatever, but, um, that's not, that's not always the case. And, and again, like these are just examples. You have to look at these things in mass um, over time. Right? And there, yeah, and there is something that is happening right now. So earlier this year, the movie Luca came out, um, which is a, I haven't seen it. I'm not going to lie. So I, I might get some details wrong. Um, but the, I believe the story is about a young boy who meets a another boy and wants to be their friends but has to keep it a secret and there's also another big secret that's going on and it is a it is a metaphor for coming out and being gay uh and disney straight up said it is not uh <laughs> even though that like their their quotes and their directors are being like oh if you interpret it that way that's great but that's not what the movie is about but it is like there's serious conversations about having to sit down and be like, I am this way and I'm scared about being this way. Like there's a whole coming out arc. There's everything. And the only thing that is missing from this story is, is Luca basically being like, I'm in love with my best friend <laughs> who is a boy. I haven't so. seen this. I haven't seen this movie either. So yeah, I don't know, but I have seen the discourse. I have seen yeah. the discourse. <laughs> and so like this is, still, this is still happening. I know that doesn't have to do about villains, but the queer coding of things still exists. Mm -hmm. it's not just a thing that was like in the disney renaissance it's it you can if you want to watch movies and look out like with this filter in mind you will find the characters that are queer coded because they happen quite a bit yeah and remember a movie is not made by one person there there's our tour theory i don't think it's real sorry if you if you have studied film and you're like yeah our tour theory no sorry i disagree movies are made by committee right they're made by a group of people yeah. and so like disney can say whatever they want about what the intention is but they don't know the minds of the hundreds of people who touched that script who touched the animations who touched the storyboards who touched everything that went into that movie right so in that way it's kind of like well they can say that but it's kind of hard to just accept it once you understand what it means to watch a movie or to read a book or something um, with queer theory in mind, right? Yeah. It's it's just one of those things where and until you put on that lens, uh, you don't think about it, which mm -hmm. is great uh, for some people to not have to do that. But again, it is that it is like, oh, that this is this is some people's every day is that they are looking desperately for these things that people are that they find and resonate within themselves. And then when all they have to see from that is the villains within these stories, it does not help. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, it makes you either align with the villains or feel pretty shitty about yourself. Yep. Uh, sure. Which tends to be how it is. So, all right. Should we? get back on track and start yes. talking about like now that we've discussed like villains in depth and the and their coding shall we talk about the why we ship with villains yeah so why so what's what's the main so we've talked about a lot of like talked around this a lot but like why why do why do you want to ship with villains why not just why not just ship with the good guys with the heroes are you a bad guy landon Yes, <laughs> I am queer coded <laughs> enough that I'm a bad guy. Uh, <laughs> no, I am because <laughs> they hot. Well, we'll talk about that too. Like, why, if you don't want us shipping with your villains, why make them so attractive? God damn it. Um, <laughs> but no, I think, um, why do I like it? Well, A, it's there's a lot of reasons. The first one that comes to mind is it's taboo, so therefore it's mm -hmm. fun. Uh, but another huge one is that I find that when when placed the, the, stereo, the stereotypical, we'll talk about Shadow and Bone since this is technically the media episode about this mm -hmm. or the fandom episode about this. Um, oh my gosh, I forgot her name. What's the main character's name? Alina. Alina, thank you. Uh, <laughs> Did you just, there's, I have died once in this episode so far and I've lost my brain and, and I want both of those parts clipped. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Poor Landon, just, she's just a little out of practice. It's okay, y'all. <laughs> Alina, uh, Alina does her best and most growth the entirety of the show 
when she is with and actively pursuing some sort of relationship with the uh with the general Mm -hmm. general Um, kerrigan yep kerrigan yes she thank you (laughs) um she grows she is not pants or she is not as much pants there is potential for character development and that is desperately what i want to see in every single character i love the development uh that characters and the journey that things can go through which is why i love torturing my character um you want to make them go through something right you want to make them change i, I want to be the same at the end. they should yeah. have they should have not only a different perspective after their character arc but they should have a completely different set of morals um that is my rule it's fine uh <laughs> But I want I want to make them feel, and typically when you are shipping with a villain, that villain makes the protagonist question. It makes them question where they stand, what their morals are, and being able to do that provides growth. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Now we talked about a little bit about um, some of this terminology in our villain episode, but just to refresh everybody here, um, uh, when we're talking about a villain and a hero, it's usually like um, you know a bad guy and a good guy, right? When we say antagonist and protagonist, what that means is the antagonist in the story is often trying to change the status quo and the protagonist is trying to keep the status quo the same. So usually what that means is your protagonist is your hero and your antagonist is your villain. So I just want to recognize we know the difference and we know that's not that's not always right, but most of the time it is, right? So antagonists, usually villains, often represent a change in the status quo for your story, right? And so those of us that don't benefit from the status quo are going to identify more likely with the villain's beliefs and values, even if we don't agree with their methods, right? So like, I think the Batman villains that, um, that Landon mentioned at the beginning uh, are very clear in regards to this. Like, I'll take Poison Ivy, for example, because I know a little bit about her. Um, she's an environmentalist, right? Like, she's here for the plants. She thinks we don't do enough for this planet, right? Now, does that mean that I think every decision that she makes in regards to this belief is is like a good thing? No, but I also think we don't do enough for this planet, you know? And, um, and I get it. Like, I get why she feels frustrated because she has been put upon in her life and not really been recognized. And then she sees that we're doing the same thing to the planet that society has done to her. And so this is her, her feeling, right? Yeah. <laughs> She's also hot. <laughs> so hot uh <laughs> so so when you have characters like like these antagonists that that have um that are against the status quo and you're kind of like well i'm kind of against the status quo too like maybe i wouldn't murder somebody for some plants but like i kind of get it you know what i mean so it makes it so much easier for 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 the girls the gays and the theys i guess you can say to connect with these antagonists because they tend to be more likely to have our values yeah um and yeah they 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 question society they Mm -hmm. question like what needs to change whereas typically in the traditional story arc of how media is presented the before was fine uh the before was fine unless okay sorry the before was fine unless the before is like an uprising so if we're taking out apocalyptic uh like genre the before was fine something happens to make it not fine and so now the character has to go through this thing of of defeating the person who is questioning what was fine Mm -hmm. um most people also realize that the before wasn't fine (laughs) uh but but that is so like it is just your interpretation and how you read it and what you relate to is so basically repeating what you were saying but yeah yes yes no but exactly exactly but but there's a lot of people who will not realize that the before wasn't fine. Uh, that yeah. they'll be like, oh, this world is, is great. Like, it's good. Life's happy. Everyone's mm-hmm. fed. And it's like, actually, no. <laughs> yeah, like, uh, have, you ever, have you ever tried to talk to somebody that, you know, that's, that's older, that has a good job, that was able to retire about, like, what the economy is like right now? And, um, and even though it's getting better, like, the pandemic has kind of put this into light for a lot of people, but there's still a good number of people out there that really think that we can solve our problems with young people just buying less Starbucks, and then they'd have money. Obviously, that's not going to happen. But this is the reason, right? Like, if you are the person that the world has basically worked out for, 
then it's very simple for you. It's very simple for you to not identify with the antagonists, right? Uh, but I also think that like, what is a good, I think storytelling has developed to the point that we want to connect to our antagonists because I think it, it makes us connect to the protagonist mm -hmm. when they start questioning the antagonist. Yep. When they start sitting there and being like, well, maybe like, oh, Katniss Everdeen. I know that this is not a ship, but we're we're gonna go with it anyway. Um, <laughs> you know, Katniss like sitting there and understanding that hey, she understands to a to an extent um, what not President Snow, President Coin, who is in the later series, who comes in and is taking over as president. Uh, she understands President Coin's perspective and gets and understands like hey, wants to punish the people who have punished them for so long mm -hmm. uh and but at the end of the day it like that questioning kept me as a reader interested because then all of a sudden there was growth happening with Katniss that she had to then make a decision and in the end spoiler alert she ends up deciding that like coin needs to die because coin and snow are the two sides of the same coin but I'm um, <laughs> uh, but yes, basically like this, this idea of like really actually being able to connect and understand the antagonist better develops your protagonist Yeah, uh, and yeah. makes a more interesting story. I do love that part about Hunger Games where you don't really, for the, for the beginning of the book, you really don't understand Snow's motivation or anything like that. But then Coin comes along and it's like, oh, oh yeah, duh. Yeah. <laughs> like, oh shit. And, and that there are and there are people who sided with coin and there are people yeah. and that would be a fun series to yeah we should probably do that on um our media we'll add it to our list <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah no i think that there is a there's really um it, there the having a good villain is the corner mark of having a good story yeah absolutely uh, and then when you get two when you get two actors in movies and media, because I, I find that I typically ship uh, villains and heroes with within movies and TV shows more than I do naturally with books. Although there are some books that are great, uh, because enemies to lovers is a fantastic trope. Mm. Um, <laughs> I think uh, I think that it also has to do with the chemistry of two actors. Yeah. Uh, the chemistry and and then the build up and being like oh I can misread this situation for tension as sexual tension because those two things look exactly the same. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> and I want to I want to go back to something that you mentioned just yeah. briefly, but I just want to expand on it a little bit. The other reason for why shipping villains, aside from just like sometimes it's for, for a lot of people, it's easier to identify with antagonists. It's also about the taboo, um, which you mentioned, but I want to expand on that a little bit. Often our sexual and romantic fantasies are about the taboo, right? They're about what we're told we can't have. And that's just a weird, funny trick of human brains, <laughs> you know? And, um, and so... I, I just want to say with this, we have a whole episode about problematic shipping that um, that if you are struggling with feelings about this, I encourage you to go watch that and then do some more research. But um, it, it's just it's just how brains work. And don't worry about it. Everybody likes the stuff they're told not to like. It's just whatever flavor of taboo you're told that you your brain latches onto. Right. It's not it doesn't mean anything. It's just natural for our carnal desires to be attached to something we're told is wrong and um brains brains are silly and that's just what they do <laughs> so brains the other yeah so the other big why is just because they're bad guys and it's literally not deeper than that it's just because they're the wrong thing and so we're interested in it because they're the wrong thing <laughs> it's not that deep <laughs> yeah. i mean yeah it's, it's not that deep like what you like anyway um yeah. let's check no. on malcolm so he's uh he's stinky and hungry and really tired oh, and good. He's, he's still having he's oh, still okay God. on his fun he's having fun in his isolation box um so that's good it's nice to know that he enjoys dying <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't think he's gonna die this episode but hopefully <laughs> he 
he'll get close to it. Maybe he'll die next week. <laughs> uh, no, I think, um, what was I going to say? Oh, yeah, taboo again. Like, and also there is uh, our brains, like, I don't know. I think that there's something fun to also explore the unexplored. And if something is taboo, the chances of you having explored that before in your writing, in your watching, in your fantasizing, like even if it's not even fantasizing about your life, but like possibilities for characters, um, it, it, there's, a, there's like a newness to it, which is fun. There's so few things in the world that are new uh, that when you discover that, it's like this really fun opportunity, mm-hmm. uh, which is yeah. what like, I experienced, experienced when we did Rabbi. When- I, when I started writing R- Rebastion, um, it, it was like this opening up of sitting there and being like, oh, I don't have to have a character that has to color in the lines. I can push those lines. And so then I got to also discover boundaries and the boundaries that I liked as a writer, but also boundaries within different characters. Uh, I got to explore a new depth because I was willing to take the morality of this character and, and twist it. Uh, mm-hmm. and make it so that the lines weren't the boundaries. I was able to discover new ones. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then being able to ship and that relationship did the same way that this certain relationship didn't have to be like, they meet, they fall in love, they get married, they have children. Uh, that all <laughs> happened. <laughs> they did. <laughs> that is their plot. But uh, they also but killed also... a lot of people along the way. <laughs> <laughs> and each other uh, almost <laughs> a few times <laughs> very close to uh, it <laughs> and and again it was like those oh this is the path that I want to take this is the story I want to do but then I got to like sit there and be like I can ignore those lines mm-hmm. uh and I can still do that directional path but I get to ignore the lines I get to color outside of it and discover new boundaries um and as a as someone who enjoys writing that to become a better writer of it I wanted to be a better I, you need to get more information. And the best way to do that is reading and consuming. So then I started reading about villains and and watching them and enjoying them even more than I had previously enjoyed them. Uh, and it kind of just fed itself. And then and then I discovered, uh, Har- like I discovered Harley Quinn and the Joker. And I was like, this is everything I want <laughs> in, a, in a writing <laughs> dynamic. And then that's it. Mm-hmm. That's where I've so- ended they they may have murdered many people but have you seen how jacked they are (laughs) honestly really good looking couple that's all i'm saying (laughs) oh jane i love this comment okay i have to read it because i think this really applies to us as role players um i think that's been the most annoying part of playing arthur is that he's so hot people like him automatically no matter how egregious i make his backstory or current actions looking forward to him being an asshole in the future and people recognizing it uh you know it's almost like real life you know (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> if you're super rich or super hot, uh, you can get away with all kinds of shit. Thank you so much for the follow, uh, 117 Gug. Happy to have you here. Oh my god. No, I... Ugh. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I mean, I, I think we've all experienced that problem, unfortunately. Um, the person I experienced the problems with most for that was actually Phoebe. Yeah, uh, because she's a young woman in any of her renditions. Uh, she tends to be a young woman who seems to be taken a ba- uh, a, taken advantage by an abusive asshole. Um, so everybody wants to come save her. Therefore, isn't responsible for any of the torture, murder, and multiple other sins that she has. <laughs> she has there. Done, okay, done. so can I just explain this a little bit? So there have been multiple occasions where Phoebe has literally been the main villain, the one that's done the most bad, the one that's killed the most people, the one that's committed the most crimes. You know, whatever, <sighs> depending on the flavor of the RP, and people have been like. Oh, this other char- this other character, male, always male. This other character who's a male, he is the bad guy that's done the most bad that I hate the most. But because v- because Phoebe is usually like a 17, 18, 19 year old girl, she's she's uwu soft and needs and just needs pretty. some saving. Mm-hmm. She's always beautiful, right? But she's but she's uwu soft and just needs saving, right? It's it's hard, <laughs> but like but then, of course, Hollywood uses that, right? They use, because we have, I mean, that's an RP problem, but it's also a Hollywood problem. We're talking about yep. how hot villains are and they're attractive. And because they are hot and attractive, 
they are allowed to do worse things. Uh, mm-hmm. Actually, this is a weird thing that happened in the Harry Potter fandom recently. I'm going on a tangent. I'm so sorry, but it's important. Uh, there's a, there's TikTok RPs uh, where where TikTokers dress up and, and cosplay as Harry Potter characters, and this one famous t- or this one very popular TikToker uh, dressed up as Peter Pettigrew, and people literally said that if Peter had been a, as attractive as this person was, they would have they would have hated him less, um, which is mind blowing. That that it literally is. Oh, if this villain was more good looking. Uh, his crimes of betrayal and killing people would have been fine. It does. So, is he one of the characters? Because you're gonna have to refresh my memory. Is he actually described as ugly in the books, or is he just He's like rat like, which is great? Okay, yeah. So he is. He's, <laughs> that's book, not just movie. Sometimes because they're all mixed up in my head. Sometimes I can't yeah, remember yeah, if things yeah. are movie only or not. No, he. <clears throat> I mean, I think he was. I think that there was an interesting director's choice to uh to make him actually look like he was stuck as a rat and very rat like uh but i think as a boy he is described as as being pudgy and bigger and slower and and have rat like features okay all right well that is what it is in in uh, malcolm update he has now pissed himself so that's wonderful and look he just fell asleep <laughs> <laughs> uh he's not long for this world slow fall into passing out (laughs) (laughs) he is Um, not long for this world but it's okay we used up the last of his pto (laughs) we love that that for him (laughs) uh so yeah no i think that that is it is a systemic problem but it's also like why it's fun to ship villains because if those villains hadn't been attractive no one's shipping like people are shipping people with dracula no one's shipping anyone to nosferatu right like (laughs) exactly the handsome one that likes to suck your blood and not the one that like turns off the light switch um (laughs) that's all i know that character from (laughs) (laughs) uh yeah it's it's part of it yep yep it's definitely part of it on you hollywood (laughs) <laughs> oh boy <laughs> um, yeah no i think and i think that um shadow of bone does an amazing example of alina and kerrigan as far as being a villain ship um that you have a you have a villain who wants to change the world and will do anything f- to do that Mm-hmm. and at least in the first half you have he just wants a better world for his oppressed people i mean i can get i get it i get it yeah uh and then and then the second half uh or in the first half alina agrees with him she wants mm-hmm. it to he's his vision uh and then once the reveal is made that he's actually a terrible human being then you know she loses body autom- autonomously and autonomy because he forces like you know body horror on her um and that's when things like change mm-hmm. for her but up until that point it made sense because even though we knew he was the villain because he was obviously the villain mm-hmm. um, <laughs> i mean he's played by ben Mar- barnes and he controls shadows like come on <laughs> Yeah, you're going to tell me that this rich, powerful man who is entirely good looking and comes in just as the love interest that is the real love interest disappears isn't the villain? Fuck you, Hollywood. Anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I think that uh, they they did it perfectly right for what it was supposed to be. Um, I was trying to think of other villain romances that are canon. And I was having a very difficult time. Batman and Catwoman yep. were one that came to mind, which is, again, fascinating. However, the... Okay, so this is the other thing, too. That these roles are reversed here, and that's because of sexism. Uh, uh-huh. Whereas <laughs> Batman never questions his morality when meeting Catwoman. Catwoman, who is the villain, is forced to question her morality in order to be with him. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's just again like if the if the roles had been reversed if it had been uh catwoman was the hero and batman was the villain it would have been a very different story because um i do believe that then she would have still been questioning her morals but it would be questioning her morals to be evil mm-hmm, mm-hmm. 
Yep. I think I think the most of the time, other than other than the one you just mentioned with Batman and Catwoman, uh, most of the time when we're talking about these villain ships, they're they're not canon, they're fanon, right? Yeah. The the only um the only kind of group that I can really think of where a lot of this stuff is canon is um is one in uh, in romance novels, right? There's a lot of those. <laughs> those are a dime a dozen, right? And CW shows, right? Um, so it's really yeah. a I media that Claire is Line should be on that list. Yeah, you're yeah, right. And, and Delena, <laughs> Delena ends up being canon, and you know, all Damon a vil- He was a villain for about three point two seconds. You know what? It still counts. I'm just saying, it's more than anything else. So, so really, a lot of this, the time that it's canon, is uh, is laser focused on things that are targeted to women. Um, it's not. It's not really in your your typical media. So we're talking about uh, CW shows. Yes. So when I say CW shows, I'm talking about things like um, Vampire Diaries and all of its spinoffs. Uh, the the Flashverse, the Arrowverse, I guess is what it's called. Um, Supernatural. Like, I mean, the boys get with, well, Sam in particular gets with monster girls all the freaking time that they end up having to kill. I mean, so yeah, CW shows, Those those, it happens there. And it's targeted to women because women like bad boys. <laughs> Well, I think, I, I mean, yes, but also, it's a little bit no! deeper than... <laughs> Women, I, I, yeah, I mean, and I said this before, too, sorry, I didn't mm-hmm. mean to cut you off. But, no, you're good. <laughs> but, no, I think that there is um, also this inherent, like, want for a man who is willing to burn down the world to get what he wants and also burn down the world to protect you which is typically how those villain romances are Mm -hmm. portrayed so it's not even like a villain it's just like i want a person who is passionate about what he wants and will fuck everybody but me over (laughs) (laughs) and i think i think it's a little bit deeper than that you know i think that a lot of these things we're retelling beauty and the beast over and over and over like we're we're delivering a story that deals with the feelings that for um, for a lot of women, it is difficult to find um, an, an equal partner. You know, that a lot of times in our relationships, we, um, you know, because most relationships aren't completely, totally equal, right? There's always a little bit of hierarchy there. And oh. usually in a straight relationship, women are not the top, right? They are They are below on the hierarchy. So I think in a lot of these things, we are channeling that truth in society and we're dealing with those emotions in that society and things like that. So that's that's where a lot of this comes from. And, um, you know, what it, it, if your man is going to be above you, you know, at least you're his entire world and he's dedicated solely to you. Right. And which is what happens in a lot of these villain romances. Oh, there's so. a sense of control there. Mm-hmm. Um, because if he's willing to burn down the world for everyone but you that means he'll listen to you yeah uh, and that means that maybe just maybe even though it seems like he is the one in charge he's not mm-hmm. and that i think speaks societally to where women are my cat is trying to go out the window sorry <laughs> Let me be free, mom. Jump. We're the second story. Please don't fucking jump. Uh (laughs) the the kittens, the kittens, by the way, they're they're sleeping soundly on the bed. They have decided not to rampage this stream, so that's been nice. (laughs) Uh yeah, so I think that there's there's also an interesting society thing to say about that. Yeah, for sure. I think we're expressing we're expressing a lot of um, we're expressing a lot of feelings and frustrations in those sorts of things. Well, then, like, let's if you're ready to talk about it, let's talk about how society reacts to us liking villain stuff. Oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) Landon, you know what that means that I'm going to bitch about and I'm going to bitch about aunties again. Are you ready? Uh, Are you ready? I am. Hold on. Let me prepare myself. Okay. Okay. So if you're on the Twitters, then you know there's a lot of teenagers and young 20 somethings that think if you ship villains, it means you are a villain in real life. Like they really truly believe this. We have a whole episode where we talk about aunties and we share a case study of a friend of ours that, um, that had an encounter with befriending someone that turned out to be an auntie. It's a wild ride. 
go watch that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in general, uh, I feel like it's something that we don't talk about. And in spaces where you do talk about it, you're, you're ridiculed in a way, um, unless you find like-minded people, like it's, it's, it's very annoying to say like, this is my preference and this is what I think is interesting. And then, um, you know, somebody say, well, what does that say about you? It doesn't say anything. It just says what I find interesting, right? Like, it's like saying, oh, I, I, I don't like broccoli. I don't eat broccoli. What does that say about you? Nothing. It doesn't say anything about you. It just means you don't like broccoli. You know what I mean? Like, it's so freaking silly. So shipping is weird to begin with, right? People that aren't in fandom do not understand it. And then when you want to ship things that are taboo, such as like in enemies to lovers or shipping the villain and the hero and things like that, um, you get the extra layer where some people that do understand shipping are going to act like you're a weirdo, right? So that's been my experience with it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Ready? I'm about to... I'm ready. Go. The way media portrays love uh, traditionally is that this person before you is supposed to be the most important thing on the planet. That they are your day, your moon, your night, your sun, your everything. Uh, and that is how love is supposed to feel. And that is how time and time again, we are told what love is by media. Um, and, and because of that, we also, I mean, you also see it in the world portrayed that way via Instagram and other social medias and watching couples hang out and you assume those things, right? Uh, even though we know that that's not true. One person can't complete you. Uh, people aren't puzzle pieces. Also, uh, like friends are important. Anyway, um, <laughs> <laughs> tangent. Uh, so it is surprising to me that when we gravitate towards somebody or a or a character that literally embodies that that is i will destroy the world except for you because you are the most important thing uh which villains and those sort of romances tend to have that sort of style uh why society and aunties then get on our ass for like being attracted to that because that is what we're told we should be attracted to amazing so like fuck you aunties <laughs> uh fuck you media for <laughs> telling us that that's what love is uh and also villains are awesome this is what i got <laughs> yep yeah no 100 percent agree like it it's just it's complicated right it's complicated yeah. and it's made more complicated with the messages that we are sent um constantly uh, and, uh, and it just, it doesn't get any easier is, uh, so is that aunties as in auntie or auntie? Oh, we're saying auntie, A-N-T-I. And in the aunties episode, we go through, um, we go through a history of the, of the word and what it means. And so if you're not familiar, go watch that. Um, it will explain to you everything about what exactly we're talking about. And then once you, once you know the word for it, you'll start noticing it in a bunch of fandom spaces. It's, it's everywhere. It's absolutely everywhere at this point. Yeah. I mean, it's, it like even exists not in fandom related stuff. Yes. Like the, the, the other yeah. word, the other word that you see a lot, puritines. Yeah. Um, fandom didn't come up with that. Um, science fiction and fantasy authors that are not in fandom came up with that because they started noticing the same thing. And their word they came up with was puritine. Well, and it's also, um, there is a, it is a subclass version of, and we talked about this, but basically um, a, a cancel culture like effect mm -hmm. uh, and like people that really just want to uh, celebrate cancel culture. <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, no, I, it's, it's very strange. Yeah. Very, very strange. <laughs> yes. Jane, these people are real. <laughs> They're not just bots on the internet. No. It is, and I, it if is you real. Haven't listened to that episode. We have Sasha on who talks about, uh, their experience with like basically being canceled and basically yeah. like witch hunted and everything like that too it's a, mm -hmm. it's a really powerful episode uh i think yep. it's hard so yeah yeah um definitely would would recommend um but yeah no it's 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 really hard and then of course you have like 
And then, and it doesn't start and end with aunties. Again, to bring it back to Claroline, uh, the showrunner was so angry that fans enjoyed this ship that, by the way, they set up. It was canon and was going to be canon. And the fact that like the showrunner got so angry that, that it was like, well, how could you ever ship this person with a murderer? Not like every other person had killed people on that show, but that's fine. Uh, Julie Plack is her name. I was trying to search for her name. That was so strange. That was uh, so strange. That like, so it's like this idea of not only aunties on the internet, but there's also a media like focus of being like, why would you do this why you're bad for doing this thing that we are literally setting you up to do <laughs> mm-hmm. and i and it's i blame the internet i blame the internet because yeah. this happened with with um with Claroline. this also happened with um with uh well what was the ship name that was regina i think that was her name and then emma swan in once upon a time swan oh, yeah. queen it also happened with swan queen where a bunch of the people that worked on the show were like really rude to swan queen shippers because so i blame social media because this is what happens these Yelena. these yeah yeah these these like hardcore shippers they get on social media and they they at and dm the people that work on the show asking for their ship to be canon and these people like don't understand fandom and shipping culture so by the way y'all stop freaking talking to creators about fandom and shipping culture they don't get it (laughs) and um and they didn't they didn't know how to take this and a lot of these these creatives would get so annoyed with the with the shipping culture that they would just be like you know, you're, you're bad for liking this, which is wrong. Like that's the wrong take, but just FYI, when Julie Plek did that, like it didn't come from nowhere. It's because Clara Liners wouldn't get the fuck out of her mentions, (laughs) but still she did say those things. It was, it was, it was like, you wanted this. (laughs) But again, it is very much like that thing of you made this thing. Yes. I mean, and I get it. Internet is overwhelming, especially if you haven't had internet fame before. Um, especially if you're super proud of other things to do with that project. Like if someone like really like, I have experienced it so where everybody really likes, likes one piece of art that I've written, uh, really likes one poem. And I'm like, but all of the other poems are so good too. Stop talking about yeah. this one. I get it. Like even on a small scale, that's very overwhelming. Um, so I, I understand where it comes from. But at the same time, it's very much like that thing that the curriculum said is it's like, you're enjoying this thing that I've created. You're awful and should feel awful. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's like, okay, stop. Uh, <laughs> and, this happened, and this is also a thing that happened before internet was popularized. I mean, uh, Buffy and Spike were a thing um, from, from um, Buffy. Love me some Spuffy. I'm here for it. <laughs> Buffy, also ship by ship. Uh, there are so many times where it's like that. It's, it's enemies to lovers specifically different than um than villain and hero ships because you you do need that archetype like villain and or antagonist but it is it still exists so it's like it's just this has been happening forever on a multitude of different genres Mm -hmm. Uh, and why people want to make people feel bad about it I don't I mean, either because you know it, it, but <laughs> the best because here's like here's the best villain ship right Persephone and Hades like Persephone becomes a badass bitch because she decides to go get with Hades right you know I mean it, we can't help it we just this is just how our brains work yeah. it's just being yeah. human it's just being human and if yeah. it's not your thing it's fine it doesn't have to be your thing but for someone else but just because it's someone else's thing doesn't mean that they're a bad person Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yep. And again, we have a whole episode about problematic shipping. And there's a couple episodes I plugged during this, but um, but I know, but that one will, it, we talk about our views and like why it's okay and it doesn't matter and you're not a bad person if you like this kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> you're not. You're normal. Mm-hmm. Um, you're totally normal. All right. Should so I know we-, we got started. We got started a little bit late. Um, So we're going to go a little bit longer, FYI, guys, but we are getting towards the end of the episode. Sorry, Landon, I think I just cut you off. No, you're good. I was basically going to say the same thing where I was like, let's talk about some ships we like. Uh, Let's let's hear about some ships from you guys in the chat about what ships you like. Um, Let's talk. uh, Let's do like another seven minutes of that. And then we'll read a good news article and wrap this up. Okay. All right. So um malcolm didn't quite die yet but he's not doing too hot he's not doing too hot so you know hopefully next episode he will he will die (laughs) all right
Uh, Claroline obviously is is a big a big fave a big fave. Uh, um, do you love want to it. talk about like the implements of these things, or are we just saying names? Um, no, we can explain what Claroline is. Give us give us a quick plot rundown of what Claroline is and oh. uh, and why it's loved. Original vampire slash werewolf villain to all kills everybody sees a blonde baby vampire and goes <laughs> you're pretty and then just simps over her <laughs> pretty much i mean klaus he doesn't like anybody he's nobody's friend he doesn't care about nothing or anybody he barely likes his siblings um <laughs> and then he sees caroline and he's like hard eyes oh, he's like, you're so oh, beautiful let me sketch things for you <laughs> and buy and- you gifts yes buy you pretty dress and also have your boyfriend bite you so you almost die and then my blood saves your life oh my Um, god (laughs) love that for them but yeah Mm -hmm. no it's it's cw but he is the big bad and while because it is an ensemble cast claroline can be considered one of the protagonists she's not the main protagonist no um but it is a it is an ensemble class, so she does count as a hero, and he was the big bad of that or of the previous half season, and then continues to be pretty bad the rest of the time he's on the show. Yeah, pretty much in in season in I think he comes in in season two, right? He comes or in season, the very end of season two. Very end of season two. Yeah, he comes at the very end of season two. He's clearly a, a big threat. He's a huge threat during season three, and then in season four, he's kind of sort of a threat in certain parts yeah so, so he's good, a big villain it's a good it's a he's a great villain uh that's <laughs> a good enemies to lovers that's what rap again rap was based off of klaus and abby and uh claroline or caroline sh- share some tastes <laughs> yes um and then again, if we're going to stick to the Vampire Diaries, Delena, as you mentioned earlier, even though mm. I would like to argue that Damon is a villain for about 2.5 seconds. Uh, he, <laughs> You're uh, going to crush his spirit. Don't let him hear you say that. Just an emo boy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's, you know, do photo and Sam count. They aren't enemies. They aren't villains. Anyway, uh, sorry, Katie, just saw that. I had to say something. Katie, that's um, a great ship, but I don't think it's relevant to what we're talking about today. <laughs> best friends. We'll talk about best friends at some point. Yeah, we should. But so many things adding to the list this episode. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, but then I think so. So uh, Lena. Wait, wait. Oh, Sookie and Eric. Did you ever watch True Blood? <gasps> that's such a good book. Jane, my heart. Guys, yes. Good one, Jane. Oh. Jasmine and Jafar, fuck yes. Mm-hmm, For Stephanie mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. Hades, although a part of me is like, it was that was that villain? Was Hades ever the villain or he's, he was just like banished to the underworld, but it's fine. <laughs> Poor Hades, he's just a geek. He's trying to do his job. He's just a simp over his wife. <laughs> That's literally all Hades does. He's like, I will protect everyone soul after they die and also simp over my wife. And his wife Zuko is like, and Katara. Uh, yes, Zuko, Zuko Katara. and Katara. Great example. That's a good one. Lord Not canon, Ring. but the good ship. Lord of the Ring series. <laughs> uh, Zuko and Guitar is a good one. Yeah. If anyone needs a book recommendation? Do I have it here? I don't fucking have it right here. It's in another room. <laughs> it is in the other room. It's fine. Um, the A Court of uh, Thorns and Roses has uh, its Beauty and the Beast esque. Uh, and but there is a huge ship that is the villain and but it's not the beast it's a different character the villain mm. uh, and hero it's fantastic that, 10 out of 10 that's actually probably got two villain it's there's two of them same girl <laughs> two villains and hero romances it's actually quite impressive mm, nice <laughs> i know that's one you want us to read at some point because uh, yeah, you love I'm it so much you, i'm making you read the fairy porn okay uh, we're gonna read fairy porn at some point Lucifer, Lucifer and Detective and Decker. Decker. Yes. That's a great one. I would yes, also yes. die for Zuko. Uh, he fits my tall blonde daddy issues, even though he only has, he's not blonde and he's probably not that tall. He's uh, he's blonde in spirit. I mean, it, it's the same vibe. Uh, listen, if there was such thing as coded blonde, Zuko would be coded blonde. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, yes. that was probably an insensitive thing to say because of how serious coding is, but that's fine. 
<laughs> we're live <laughs> okay but katie was frodo sorry my train is going by it's ending right now uh katie was frodo like selfish or was that just the ring's power that's the question i have for you big daddy I mean, i'm not i'm i think it's i mean it's a valid ship um you're oh, not wrong katie ship. no yeah. it's a great ship i just was more saying like um that was more of a lord of the rings conversation that doesn't <laughs> happen here i'm we're losing it anyway um what's another one all that of I these like? are wonderful these are anything all wonderful. for me anything that's like uh -huh. hades and persephone flavored or beauty and the beast flavored like i'm gonna be all around all about it i'm gonna be all about it and if it has that kind of flavor like yes i'm i'm here it's good dark lena and or dark lena did a great job um, yes Oh my uh, god, Dark Lena is such a good Hades and Persephone ship. Oh, so good. Because mm. I still stand by Darkling is right. In 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 years when um when uh the dude I forgot his name because he's so boring. When he excuse me, when he's gone, um the uh, Kerrigan will still be there. So <laughs> uh so, Jane, Mal. yes. Uh, read more. Uh, Spuffy is a great series, is a great, uh, villain mm -hmm. and, and hero relationship. Mm -hmm. Uh, Joker and Batman, <laughs> Batman and Catwoman. Mm -hmm. uh, hell, hey, uh, we'll go Joker and Harley Quinn, even though we don't see Harley much as the, as the hero, uh, still gotta love it. Still gotta yeah. call it up. Um, yeah, I think that they're so in line with uh, enemies to lovers that it's just fun. No one that doesn't. <laughs> I want to. Yeah, I get you, curriculum. I got you, but that's also like that takes away all the fun. Is it still Joker and Harley if it's healthy? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's another ship. I'm like that's <sighs> that would. It I don't would know. Be I don't even know what it would look like because I don't know the Joker is inherently unhealthy. Uh, I don't know what the Joker would be like without being, you know, Joker like. Yeah, I feel like um, it would take it would take a, quite a change to Joker's character for it to do a healthy version of Joker and Harley. I don't I don't think Harley would have to change that much, um, but I think Joker would have to change quite a lot. Although, if you would like to read a really great. Uh, fan fiction from Joker and Harley Quinn, the Harley Quinn, uh, the Harley Quinn, not Harley Quinn, uh, is a fantastic book, uh, but it's not a book because it can't be published. So would recommend it. It actually is a healthy version of them. Oh, um, well, there you go. You love it. It's, I mean, they're not, they're not good people. They're villains, but they're not abusive assholes to each other. <laughs> <laughs> they're not good. They're not bad to each other. Right. That's what we're yeah, saying. They're, okay. Yeah. It's like trying to justify it. Um, <sighs> all right are we yeah, ready for the good news article so let's do the good news article okay let me save the game while you get that going we love it all right so malcolm didn't quite die but he's in his box so don't worry he will be dead soon so that those those points will be well spent and um and then we'll have to wait we'll have to wait um until we can kill off another sim because we'll be down to just landon and the the two kids and so we won't have anybody that's eligible to die of that for us. All right, I'm switch All back right. to webcams for a second while I get this closed and get Chrome up. So bear with me just a moment, y'all. Okie dokie. Sorry, there is a really loud train going by, so I'm gonna close my window. Okay, go for it. All right. Scientists studying crows get another surprise. They're so smart they understand the concept of zero. I just what? wanted to post this because I feel we'll eventually be overthrown by crows. Uh, crows and dolphins are really coming for us. I mean, crows uh, are really smart. Like they and they can like recognize faces. They yeah. know who has been nice and mean to them in the past. Yeah. They um they uh they constantly are like doing social activities together. Crows are crazy. Yeah, and as it says here, um, right now, like in teaching, I understood this. Like I read this, and I was like, holy shit, that's amazing, because zero, while it seems like 
in concept, one of the easier things to comprehend uh, mathematically, it's actually one of the hardest uh, because it's not nothing. Um, it's basically represents nothing, but it's a placeholder and it's really complicated to like understand that and to even teach it. And mm -hmm. so the fact that crows know it is insane. <laughs> mm -hmm. Like, cause you have to teach it to a, to a person. Like humans don't inherently yeah. understand zero. They have to be taught the concept of zero. So, um, the fact that a crow can figure it out, like that's pretty crazy. No. And it's, it's really, really, really cool. Um, and yes, curriculum crows are terrifying. And if you have to call a group of a murder that, you know, like they're just the villains of the animal kingdom, even though they're misunderstood, <laughs> it's fine. Uh, the real hero to the real hero to villain love story here is my love for crows. Um, <laughs> anyway, sorry. Just no, I love this. This is awesome. <laughs> This is awesome. Um, I, and I love I love the concepts of different animal intelligences, like um, just something that I was that I've been thinking about. This is totally unrelated, but just a thought that's been crossing my mind lately. Like you notice how after um, Coco passed away, they don't really study like ape trying to learn human languages anymore. It's because they never could. Right. Spoilers that Coco never really, never really signed. She wasn't doing that. Anyways, um, there's really fun papers on that uh, if you're interested. But um but I, it makes me think about this idea of like, we are constantly trying to have animals um, learn and communicate in the way that humans do, instead of recognizing the amazing diversity with which they communicate. And so when we learn these various things about how some animals can do this, that and the other, like, it's just, it's just wild. It just makes me really think like that, um, you know, human intelligence isn't superior. It's just human. Like, that doesn't mean crow intelligence is, is superior to other animals. It's just suited for what crows need to do to live. And apparently to live, they need to understand the concept of zero, which is freaking amazing. <laughs> or they need, like, they maybe not even need to live, but that they have the ability, like, they have such high complex thinking. Yes. That their brain is ready to accept that because like yeah. we as humans don't need to understand the concept of zero to live. No, but because um, we need to do so many other complicated things, we can't, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, because now to... as a society, our brain is capable of making these, these like assumptions mm -hmm. and things like that. It's not something that we inherently know, just kind of like reading. Humans don't inherently know how to read. We have to teach how to read. Mm -hmm. Um, but our brains are able to adapt to that and able to learn that and able to do that. And crows are the same way uh, that they're able to learn how to uh, understand the concept of zero. Yeah, and I guess that makes sense because crows also have really complex social structures and hierarchies and things like that, like humans do. Like yeah. ours are really complicated and crows, is, crows are as well. Um, yeah, queer, so queer coded birds, you got it. <laughs> You love them queer coded birds um yeah so it's a, it's a really fascinating article that talks about like the importance and what zero is and and the counting crows thought because the, us testing the ability to uh for crows to count isn't a new thing uh it's been happening since the 20th century bc mm -hmm. like it's like it or not 20th century um like second century bc like it is it is really insane um how how long it is that we've been kind of training or studying crows uh and they're just they're great <laughs> Yeah, so I want to read this quote. I want to read this quote at the bottom of the article. So the bottom, this is basically the bottom line of the whole thing. This research suggests that the neural foundations that allow sensory consciousness arose either before the emergence of mammals or independently in at least the avian lineage um, and do not necessarily require a cerebral cortex. So you don't need your cerebral cortex to count. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> no, it's it's real cool um and crows are cool and like and like you said that they are just so smart and sympathetic and um animals like that they understand like who's been nice to them who hasn't been nice to them uh what nice even looks like like they have like it's not just feeding right mm -hmm. it's also things like like favors <laughs> like they will yeah. bring you stuff crows will bring you things if they like you which i think mm -hmm. is the ultimate thing 
Yeah, they understand the value of um, giving kitsch to each other as a yeah. as a form as a gesture of of kindness. <laughs> of like they develop friendship, and it's really cool. Uh, and yeah. I agree with you. I agree with like that um, learning that how other animals communicate over the last twenty years has been fascinating. Like, yeah, like my favorite are I mentioned them before dolphins, but also like orca whales, which is a subspecies of dolphin, actually not whale. Fun fact. Yeah. Um, and how they communicate and speak literally different languages in different parts of the world. Uh, that like different families speak different languages and that that's just so cool. Mm -hmm. I love this this comment from Curriculum. Um, my fiance's grandmother has, or grandfather, sorry, my fiance's grandfather has made positive relationships with the crows in his backyard by feeding them peanuts in the morning, but now he has to upkeep otherwise fear the crows wrath. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Well, as soon as just know that your fiance's grandfather sounds cool as fuck. Mm -hmm. uh, but also, hopefully, that they're bringing him stuff in return because crows are notorious for doing that. They're notorious mm -hmm. for being like, here is a shiny thing. I hope Be he gets good friend. crow gifts. <laughs> love languages are gifts. Yep. <laughs> Who knew? All right, guys. Let's switch it back to the webcam only. Also, so I'll be big so I can show you guys. Look who just came to visit. Oh, little lady. She oh, says hi, everybody. Gracious. She'll, she'll do her dance so for big. you. <laughs> hey, little lady. Oh, 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 oh. Oh, fun kitten style. Oh, my I do this God. to her all the time. She's so tolerant. Oh, my <laughs> God. I love it so much. <laughs> this is everything I needed. Oh, my gosh. All right, y'all. All right. Landon, where can everybody find you? Oh, I have a thing now. Oh, you have a thing. You have a thing. Show us the thing. Hold on. Is it exclamation <laughs> first? Is it... Yeah, you have to do an exclamation first. I should have been prepared. Nope, that's not it. Yeah, no, no space. No space. Oh, man. I'm failing, guys. You almost have it. There we go. Hell yeah. That's <laughs> right there. Um, I'm also going to drop something else, too. I found out some news on Monday, which is good news, great news. Um, but I found out, so the history of how what I'm supposed to be doing next year as a job has changed significantly this summer. I was hired to teach social studies. I was going to teach social studies and math. And now I'm teaching ELA, uh, which is great and fun. But it also means that I am responsible for three people's uh, or three classes uh, books and recommendations and because the school system in general is crappy um, I don't have any funding for my class library so I figured instead I have an Amazon list on there but I figured I would also drop this opportunity that if you would like to fund a six, fund a sixth grade uh, classroom books I would really appreciate it uh, and I'm going to just drop that list in there no pressure at all if they're again it's whatever, but if there was a book that you really loved and it was on this list, I know a lot of students would appreciate it. Um, so I'm just gonna put that in there. I started reading Dragonlance, I think, in the sixth grade. Fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Awesome. Yeah, Thank so you, you so much, I, Landon. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So if y'all are interested in in helping with that, helping some kids out, um, please do so. All right. So here's where you can find me, of course, right here on Twitch also, and on YouTube. Oh, no, hang on. Sorry. Kitten wants to eat, a, eat some vinegar. That's not good. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, uh, so right here on Twitch, of course, is one of the places that you can find me. We have Interstage Window every Saturday, and next Saturday, we're going to be talking about habits that kill your role play. So we're going to be talking about things that, that we think like thought processes, and um, repeated behaviors that really mess with the whole process of a collaborative writing um, activity. And we're gonna be playing some more Sims too. So come tune in to see Malcolm die probably. <laughs> Thank hopefully, God. Hopefully Sim Land is not too sad about it. I'm sure the kids are gonna be sad, but hopefully Landon uh, bounces back pretty, pretty well. We'll see. Oh, she, she will, she needs to find another man with a trust fund, so. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> we can work on that. <laughs> Um, also, I stream on Thursdays. All these times are Eastern. That's 6.30 on Thursdays. That's um, my stream that's kind of a little bit of whatever I want, a little bit ca more casual, a little bit more hangout. We're playing through Final Fantasy X right now. We're in the um, 
end game part i'm going around trying to get all the celestial weapons next week i'm going to be doing the butterfly mini game so if you want to see me fail over and over and get real frustrated uh come to that because i couldn't find a mod that would help me beat it and it's really hard <laughs> Um, so that's all the main places you can find me. You see all the links that I just posted. I do everything like every other content creator does. Nothing special or crazy here. Y'all know how it works. All right, We're... Landon, anything else before I find somebody to raid? I don't think so. I think that that's okay. it. Um, other than it's great to be back, even though it was a little silly this last half. <laughs> I like the silliness though. It's fun. I think two broke to croak is my fave sim moment today. Glad we got it started. Yeah. That's so fucking hysterical. <laughs> True. Love, love your rest of your, uh, have a great rest of your day too, curriculum. Thanks for joining us today. Yes, we absolutely will. Okay, we're going to raid Wabsit. He's um he's a friend of mine. Oh, uh, thank you so much for the applause, Katie. Now Landon can live another week. Another <laughs> <laughs> um, we're gonna raid Wabsit. He's uh he's one of my friends. Oh, uh, no! like wow, indeed, curriculum, very well. Um, it looks like he stepped away for a second, but it's still going, and he's playing marbles. So you can exclamation play marbles um before he comes back and get that get that started. He's on an eight hour uh Microsoft flight sim trip going across the U.S. So you Easy. can enjoy all of that. All right. Well. All right. Don't forget to be awesome. Yeah, and don't forget to make it a great day, guys. All right, bye, y'all. See you on Thursday or next week, whichever I see you. Okay, bye, guys.